So while we wait for Billy to head on over, um, what uh, what should I be listening to? Here's what I want to do. See if you think it's a good idea. I want to create a kind of curated Twitter stream, right, with a specific hashtag. Only certain people can post. And when these invited group of people post music, it'll it'll come through one stream, links to music. Because yeah. I personally am feeling completely overwhelmed in this era of I can listen to whatever I want. Anybody else having that feeling to go to, you know what I'm saying? It's like, and, and we've, we've rebelled so strenuously, and I think appropriately, against terrestrial radio, right? Oh, terrestrial radio is horrible. But <laughs> what we need is we need curators. We need people that, um, that are able to kind of come in and say, you should listen to this. So, what should I listen to? What am I missing? What am I listening to? So much jazz. Very little, very little kind of new rock. I like, um, I do like the new Vampire Weekend record. Um, I know there's a huge backlash against them. I still think that their music, I feel the way about them as I do sort of about Wes Anderson or Woody Allen, and that even their kind of maybe best work is still it, it, maybe their not best work is still better than most people's stuff. Yeah, I, just, I don't see how you can listen to those records and not go, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, a lot of old hip hop. Still can't find any good new hip hop to save my life. I would love somebody to push me in some new hip hop. I have some ducklings. Speaking of me. new hip hop, Billy O'Connell. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, have you told them? I have. Okay, so we're merging classes. We have very few people here. There's more than seven. seven. It's it's ten. Okay. Uh, and uh, oh, yeah. So you're wearing it. I have lavaliers. Yeah. Okay. I, I was just discussing Billy uh, what we were talking about how the the need for filters, the need I need some new music to listen to. I was trying to get them. Nobody had any suggestions except for David Blade. Brian Blade. Who's Brian Blade? Oh, Brian Blade, the drummer. Yeah. New Orleans drummer. He's. Oh, but, 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 wait, but as a singer songwriter, as yeah. what? Mama Rosa. It's yeah. a pretty good album. Oh, my God. Brian, first of all, he's one of the loveliest human beings you'll ever meet. Yeah. He's, um, he's, he's a drummer. I met him when he was drumming for Daniel Enwa. Oh. And he's an absolutely phenomenal man, but also a, the most beautiful drummer. Wow. And, uh, and I trust him to be a great songwriter. Okay, I'll buy that. Uh, what do I? What am I supposed to do with this? Do I just like? Do I thread it? No, you don't have I don't have. Just right. take a note on Brian Blade. Okay, so is that it right there? Yeah, That's fine. fine. Who else? Discovery. Huh? Discovery. I've heard of them. Yeah, I've heard of them. They've been around forever, right? <laughs> okay. Don't know them. What's their story? They put out an album. It's pretty dope. Dope, huh? What type of dope music is it? Uh, like rock. Like alternative. alternative rock? Okay. Like oh, okay. Oh, uh, well, you just, you just convinced me not to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? See, this is what I mean. I, I find this troubling. What? Can I get techno? Amon Tobin? I know Mastercraft. The National. The National. The National. I love. Yeah. I do. Took me a while, but I do. I do get them and like them. Yeah. Easy Company. Easy Company. Yes, we <laughs> like Easy Company. Yeah, Aubrey. How are you? So alive, I know. You never came to see me about that. We'll talk. Don't know the Royal Family. They're uh, they're these group of uh, if you want to. funk jazz guys from up in New York. They're all crazy players, and they started this uh, like it's called the Royal Family. It's this record label management booking. They all book themselves. I think it's a really good like model for you know and, like, you know, coalitions in New York. It's like these these guys that all hang out together like Adam Dice and Jackson Weather and so alive and and they do their they have their own business and they're independent and, and So what are the uh, what are the inherent um, problems and advantages of doing something like that. Because, you know, if, if, if we went, if we're in this kind of stage now where we went from, you know, yeah, we need more. label. We'll need more. Here, take it. Equals. They're online. They're online. 
to label equals only alternative to label equals bad to artist as label to artist as label not working Is that accurate? Though? Why do you mean what? What do you mean when you say artist is labeled not working? So, there there are uh, cases artist, where artist got to this stage. Yeah. Labels are bad. I'm gonna do it myself. Yeah. Oh shit! It's a lot bigger than I thought. I don't know how to do it. Right. I can't do it all myself. So label label uh, artist is labeled not working means the creativity suffers. Yeah. Because of business constraints. Right. Right. And, you know, I think that there are some exceptions to that. What, what, but, and I wouldn't put what you and Kristen do in this category. I no. think you're maybe the, the next step, and maybe it's what you're talking about. But I think there's another next step, too. Right. The, the other next step could be uh, finding a la carte solutions. For, for what? For cert label services, okay. even management services. You know, distribution, digital distribution. I mean, you know, you can put together a, a menu of readily available uh, best practices, good salute, you know, positive solutions. So this becomes top spend, right. cash, band, band camp, band camp, CD baby, or uh, say tune core. Tune core, yeah. Uh, you know, it doesn't speak to this, right? Right, marketing. right. Um, you know, here's your distro. But now you get things like IOTA verging into the marketing world, right? Okay, we'll talk about that for a second. Okay. I, I've had my biases against IOTA from the start. Oh, yeah, well. Because um, they represented themselves as a marketing company, mm -hmm. right? And are they doing that? I don't think that they're delivering that. But they're promising that. They, they promise it. They know that it needs, that it's a need. Right. Right? There are things like tool shed. It's a need because of this. Yeah, right, right. right. It's 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 a it's a function, formerly provided by a label. Right. It's one of the things artists miss now that labels have gone down the shitter. Right. Do we swear in this class? Yes. Or, okay. <laughs> Great. I just didn't know. Fuck you. Yeah. What? <laughs> okay. So it's one of the things that artists miss are missing now that their label relationships have disappeared. Right. Right. And and there are a lot of people who see that that need and and want to fill it. Or at least say pay lip service to the idea that they need to fill it. So it always comes back to this. Yep. Right. Yep. So if, if this isn't working, the label's not working. There are now yeah. these tools. There are these Sorry. things that have to be aggregated. Happily, the band MGMT comes in and solves all the problems. Right. <laughs> um, and I think that that's kind of the, the premise of this class. You know, the role of the manager has changed massively in the last three or four years, probably. And certainly in the last 10 years. 10 years, for sure. 10 years, you as manager, it was about, and I remember because it's how we first crossed paths, mm -hmm. getting a record deal and working the label. Absolutely. Is that, is that accurate? Absolutely right. It was like, it was, it was my job to put together the team, right? And to find a good solution. At the time, it was easy to, if, if, you, you, know, if you had something going, to find somebody who wanted to go into business with you as a, Joint venture, which is which was what we did with Ryko. First time, yeah, first time I was involved with Ryko Disc, it was as a joint venture. It was a very interesting, you know, new model at the time, and it seemed like a good way to go. I, I could find a way to get involved to bring my artist to a company. We could do business together, and then I could, I could, I could work on other aspects of business development, leaving certain ones to the label, but always babysitting the label, always going in and saying. What are you planning? You know, you always had to chase a label. You always had to say to a label, what are you doing? Can I see the marketing plan? Here's my marketing plan. Um, uh, you're not doing enough. Um, you know. Uh, the label was supposed to do the marketing, the manufacturing, and the distribution. Right. Correct? And maybe, maybe some master licensing. Right. Trying to find yeah. some, some opportunities for the music to the master they control to be used in film or whatever. Right. right. And, and you 
as you said, can I see the marketing plan? How do I how try do I to keep my, my function as a manager was to try to keep them honest, right? I just wanted to know that they were doing what they were taking all this money to do. They were taking a lot of our money to, provo to, pro to, to provide a function, to provide a service. And I wanted to know, I mean, prior to a, a joint venture, I, I wanted to know that the label was doing the best they could to optimize my artist's performance. The other aspect of this that was so scary at the time was that uh, a label could, could cost you a record and now that SoundScan exists or existed, you'd find that your value in the marketplace was diminished by their poor performance. So the label did a shitty job working the record. They just were ineffective and unfocused and terrible. And SoundScan went from 60,000 to 20,000. And then all of a sudden, my artist is only worth 20,000 in the marketplace. And nobody listens to your excuse, oh, well, the label didn't work for us. Right. Or we did everything we could, but it was a great record, and no. And all of those things brought us to label right. equals bad. Because a lot of the things that labels gave us, we were finding we were able to do or already doing a little bit of on our own right. in this creeping self-sufficiency, right? It was this slow climb. And it was a slow, creeping self-sufficiency. Pre-Facebay, pre-Twitter, pre-digital you know, sales. Right. This was always the hurdle. Right, right. Trucks need, needed yeah, to carry needed that truck around. Yeah. You could cobble something. You could hire a publicist. You can manufacture or do a P and D deal. You can't. You couldn't do that. Yeah. Right. And when we think about it now, this is still, in some respects, the problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's a new set of problems. But having your CD or your downloads up on iTunes, mm -hmm. because the floodgates have opened, everybody's on iTunes. Mm -hmm. It switches back to this, right? right? How do you make people people aware of it? So, you know, if you look at all of, uh, if this was the kind of main thing there, as we get to management, for me, it becomes this, or some sort of biz dev, you know, these two things. Mm -hmm. Because the rest of the stuff, as you say, you can cobble this together, Yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, the manager is now like the quarterback, you know? Right. You got the playbook. And you got all these players. I mean, I hate sports analogies, but I use them more than anyone I know. I, I, I don't know why. Sorry. But it's like the manager is, is looking at this kind of at the, at the field and at these, these players. And hopefully, he's digested the playbook. She has digested the playbook to a certain extent and knows what the next right action is. The manager has expressed the playbook to the artist. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, yeah, and, and, and the playbook, well, the, look, I think that in that, if, if, to extend the metaphor, the playbook is probably written by the manager and the artist, right? right? Or the manager in response to the artist's goals and desires. And, and so, you know, as we kind of segue, because this is, in my mind, I've never taught this course as a purely music management course, but more as a management course. Right. And to use your analogy, we get into this kind of psychologist coach relationship. Right. And it's really an HR relationship, right? Yeah. A human resource thing. Yeah. And so as the management, this is your this is your human capital, mm -hmm. you know? And what we're going to talk about through this semester is the best ways to get the drive that human capital. Um, but I also want to I want to kind of balance it against creating that game plan. I would like for you guys to leave the class with a game plan of, okay, I've got an artist, I am an artist, I can walk out of this class with what I'm going to do to give myself the best chance to get my music heard. Right. Yeah, because what you're trying to do is, is um, increase the odds. Right. You know, you're just trying to, you're trying, to, trying to tip the scale a little bit, and that's, that's the challenge. Yeah. Now, when you say management is HR, you know, you don't mean that you have to be a people person to be a manager, do you? Well, no, I'm not a people person. <laughs> exactly. This <laughs> um, is why I asked the question. I think yeah, that's a good point. I mean, so you know, what are the care? I mean, some of the best. You are a people person, and you're probably the best manager I know. But I know a lot of managers that are not people people, but are are good managers, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's the thing. I was thinking of managers who are pretty hateful people who do a good job managing. I just hate. I like to think I'm not hateful. It's a private. Um, it's a private thought. Yeah. Like uh, no, but I mean, I think about managers that, that aren't garrulous, aren't like you know, 
I don't know. I mean, give, who, are, who are the managers that you look to in respect? Well, I learned, I learned about management from, from very reputable and good people, uh, Burtis Downs and Jefferson Holt. They were my, uh, REM's they, managers. they were REM's managers. And um, when I was confronted with the choice of going into management, it was while on the road with REM, the band that I was working for asked me if I would manage them. And, um, and I went to Jefferson and asked him, Jefferson at the time was a co-manager, and, and I went to him and I said, can I manage? Like, I've, I, I know label stuff. I was a label manager and uh, I would really like to, uh, to be an artist manager and I don't know what I'm gonna do next. I had just left Warner Brothers and he said, dude, you're already managing. And I said, I said but you know, like you're, you're the guy I see as the shining example. And, at the time, he had just signed REM to Warner Brothers. And he said to me, look, all the things you would do in your position as their label manager, as their, you know, you can do, you can, you can continue to do, start with what you know, and then roll in, you know, continue to just work on, in their best interest. Right. Just always do what, what's right for the band and, and stay in sync and believe in them and know them and just continue to, to love the band. And I, and, and so I took, I took his advice and continued to go to him for advice, and um, and I started managing in 1989, and uh, and, and and really I, I I started to just see it as an ex as a logical extension of what I had already been doing. I saw myself as an artist advocate at the label. Right. I, I thought what was good for the artist was good for the label, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, Maybe I worked in. A, maybe there was a little conflict of interest there. I don't know. I didn't think so, but um, it, it was nice to throw off the constraints right. of having to work for, uh, 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 you know, work in the company's best interest. And I think you know, the qualities of a manager. You know, you've got to be. When you said throw off constraints, you've got to be entrepreneurial. You've got to be um, risk taker. You know, self sufficient. All these qualities. And I think it's something that you all need to think about with yourselves. I don't think management is for everyone. I really don't. I've seen some piss poor managers out there. Uh, and, and it tends to be the ones that are, the, the worst ones in my opinion, are the ones that are still looking for that label kind of hand to God, waiting mm -hmm. for, you know, what, what are you, I can't do anything until a label, a tour, or whatever. Yeah. You're screwed. Life starts when I blank. Yeah, right. When this drops out of the sky. So, you know, we'll focus on, on these types of, of qualities as we move through the class. I think you have to be an experimenter, right? Is there is entrepreneur, risk taker, I think that's probably the closest to an experiment. You know, you have to, you have to be looking for answers all the time well, and like looking for answers in new places. And that's biz dev, in yeah. my opinion, too. Um, you know, I, I have to say, I, um, I started management in 1989 and I worked the labels up until uh, what began the ramp towards self-sufficiency was the internet. Yeah, that's right. Right. So as soon as as soon as we could have a website, we did have a website, and it grew out of an AOL group. Yeah, right. There was an AOL group devoted to the band I was managing, and and um, and I and, and I participated in that um, forum. It was like a, a, a I think it was a forum, right? It was like a, a folder group thing. Right. And. I saw that, they, that there were these uh, 1,100 people talking about my band. And I just thought the dumbest thing in the world for me w you know, would be for me not to hang out in that group. So I, I, went, I went to the group, and every time somebody asked a question that I had the answer to, I would answer it. And whenever somebody wondered aloud about something, and I could elucidate you know, the, the conversation, you know, like grow the conversation somehow, I would, I would offer something. And I did it under my own name. Right. And I did it. And, and, I, and, and if somebody said, well, how do you know so much? I would say, oh, I'm the band's manager. And people were freaked out like, I, that there was personal service. Like, but I saw it as customer service. I, did, I, thought it, I thought I did maybe an hour a day. And, and immediately when the internet happened and, and web browsers occurred, it seemed like a logical extension of the business to have a website and to have a, a message board. And uh, so we built a website in 1995 and started inviting people from the AOL group to, 
to our website and message board, and we'd give them things in return. And that is, is exactly what started that sort of ramp up toward the, the day when I said, well, what are you doing for me that I can't do for myself? That's and when it happened. Yeah. And I mean, I've written recently a lot about the kind of leveling effects that have taken place over time. Mm -hmm. The internet was the big one the, 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 to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about, you know, asking permission, inviting people, one of the themes that you and I talked about want the class to be is, is this idea of, of VRM, which is vendor relationship management. It's the opposite of CRM. Anybody know what CRM is from their other classes? Sorry? Exactly. What does that mean? Yeah, this room, the acoustics are horrible. Yeah. Take a more, you're right, but take a, take a more um, cynical view of what customer relationship management might mean. I, I don't feel it's cynical. I feel it's accurate, but to, to spur you along, what... Who's in control? Uh, they are. In customer relationship management, how, how do you want it, the relationship to be? No, it's interesting you're saying that, but that's not it. The, the thing is, with customer, no, but Dane, you're, you're, you're trying, and it's good flailing because what you did was you hit on VRM, really. Yeah. But, what, but what, what, what the point of customer relationship management is that you're, as the company, managing that relationship. You you're want to manage that relationship. You want to manage the customer, right? And that's, mm -hmm. and that's putting you in that sort of patriarchal position. Controlling. Yeah. Right? I mean, so it, everything you said was right. But, but that, when I ask you to take a cynical point of view, you're making the customer think that he or she is making the choices when in actuality they're just a rat in a maze. You see what I'm saying? And, and when you think about the way the record business has gone, it, it's, a, it's a classic example of the failure of that, um, most notably as a result of what? At what point did we know that whatever supposed customer relationship, whatever relationship we had with our record labels, with our vendors as customers, was gone. Yeah, when they did what? Yeah. No. When they started suing us, <laughs> right? I mean, at that point, they had clearly determined that, um, that, they, that um, we were no longer being the rat in the cage going to the cheese that they wanted us to, correct? So what did they do? They tried to kill the rat, right? Um, and, and how has that worked? It's horrible, right? It's not, it's not worked one little bit. There's not a major label out there that is working. It's not working, you know, for any of them. So if you flip it around, VRM, puts the shoe on the other foot, and it allows the customer to manage their relationship with the vendor. And it gets into this idea, in the words that Billy were using, we invited people to, to come and join us, right? You've heard of permission-based marketing? What is it? You must have heard of this somewhere along the way, right? Well, people who had my class last semester better say freaking yes. <laughs> what is it? We talked a lot about it. Somebody elucidate me. Come on, Alex. Elizabeth. <laughs> ben. Exactly. You have to have permission. To, you, know, you, can't just, you can't just cold call. You can't just interrupt. Right? You have to have something of a relationship that permits you to speak to them. They have to have granted you some form of permission to speak to them about the thing. When you order a hamburger at McDonald's, would you like fries with that as permission marketing, right? You've just, you've just said, I want to buy a hamburger from you. OK, well, then you've implied the permission to offer you something else right? at that moment. Let me give you a counterexample. I just came back from Disney, right? I survived. <laughs> um, you go and you eat a meal at, like with the princesses. <laughs> and after you're done, I'll bring pictures. Um, 
After you're done eating the meal with the princess, which is a ridiculously expensive proposition, particularly if it's in Cinderella's castle, which is where it was. Yeah, no, no kidding. You're a better man than I am. The best part of it was, I still laugh about this. So my, my daughter is five, and, and she's sitting at the table, and my little son, Henry's three, and he's sitting next to her. And, um, and I got to get this right. Snow White comes in. All the princesses paraded through, and Snow White, very realistic Snow White, comes up to Annabelle and says, Hello, princess. <laughs> is this your dwarf? <laughs> <laughs> And Henry just goes, I'm not a dwarf. You know? But I just thought that was so good. Like she didn't break the wall at all, the character, to the, at the expense of my three-year-old calling him a dwarf. Okay. Hello, princess, is this your young dwarf here? <laughs> no, I'm grumpy. I'm the dwarf. Um, but anyway, so you go through this ridiculously overpriced meal, and your children are criticized for being small at the happiest place on earth. And, and you walk out, and then they put you in front of you know, some backdrop, and they take your picture, right? And then as you're, then you got to go through some other funnel, right, with product array all beside you. And then they hand you the picture, and there you are with your smiling family, and they say that'll be 35 bucks for the picture. Now you can decline. You can say, I don't want the fucking picture, right? But now you've got picture with the wife, with the kids, everybody going, oh, they should have asked in advance. You want your picture taken with the princesses? It's almost impossible to say no to five-year-old daughter with a picture of Snow White. It, you know, 35 bucks, the, down, the, uh, the, the, the alternative is to have five-year-old daughter crying for a week and a half because you don't have picture with, you know, that is not permission-based marketing. Yeah. It's a scam. That's a it's scam. strong-arming scam. Right. That's customer relationship management, in fact. It, it's genius you, customer, you, I mean, that you, is the definite. You were in the maze, you yeah. were in the funnel. Yes. And they were going to make it as painful as possible they were, they were working your pain points, right? Oh, yeah. They were making it as painful as possible for you to back out. Right? And you think they haven't thought this through to oh. a science? I mean, it, is, it really is a study in customer relationship management. Go to Disney sometime. They get you from the moment that you walk in through that funnel, and it literally is a funnel. You walk off the Snow White ride right into Snow White store. You guys been there, right? Yeah. You know it's of what I speak. It's the most manipulative place on earth. It is. It absolutely is, and yet we had, we, we had a good time. That's what they call um, it now, actually. The most manipulative place. But so that, you know, give me an example of how the music business does that or did that. You know? What was the classic example of, of the failure in v, of VRM, and it's just like VRM with one letter difference? Thank you. What does that mean? And what, why is that a failure? And I'm glad you're standing up to talk about this as you leave. I know. And you're going to bring a report back. Yes. So what was the problem with DRM? What was the most egregious problem? How did it make you feel? How yeah, did how DRM did it make, make you, you feel? feel? Ask, ask Violated. You. Violated. Why? Because I had to pay for it. Right. You can't do what you want with it. Right. it was, did anybody feel insulted? Well, like sometimes you would buy music. Oh, okay, so now that's, I'm glad you brought that up, sir. Is it a good way to make money? No, but I, I, don't, I just don't think it's shocking. No, I don't think anybody's shocked. My brother was. He like smashed a bunch of Sony products because he was so pissed about it. Your brother needs therapy, but beyond that, <laughs> you know, the thing is that it, it, it's, it's, it isn't shocking. It is, it is insulting because you're supposed to, like, you know, you, you're taught. You have a relationship with a label. At least I remember in the old days, I, you know, I, I had a, I had preferences about labels. There, certain labels made me feel happy to look at their logo. I'd go, oh man, it's going to be good because it's on Sire, or oh, it's likely to be good. It's on Mute or whatever. And 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 I felt like it was a total violation. Like, what what are you talking about? Yeah, well, how can you tell me what to do? It, 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 you know, this is it, you're strong arming me. You're not suggesting or building sympathy or making me a, uh, a partner in this, you're, you're, just, you're just forcing me to do it that way, your way. 
and, you're not, and it, it's not a smart system, it's a dumb system. And that was the issue, is that it was also very dumb, and it was a blunt instrument. It was a blunt instrument, that's exactly right. Yes. It, They watermark it. I mean, they put they put so when you take when you rip a CD into your computer, it throws a little piece of code out. You know, they're good at that stuff. I mean, the security, encryption, all that stuff. There are lots of industries why, around that's it. That's why people like the you know like at a, what is it iTunes Premium, iTunes Plus, iTunes or, Plus. You yeah. know, DRM free MP3s. At that point, there's no piece of intelligence in there that knows where the file is. Or and, Amazon. Amazon, Amazon MP3, MP3 has. DRM. I mean, I I switched. The day Amazon MP3 launched, yeah. I switched and bought everything from them. No, I'm with you. You know what's funny? There well, wasn't that all. I mean, this is this was three years ago. <laughs> now I totally agree. I mean, it, it's it's great. Well, with Daytrotter, we're going to start selling um, selling catalog records at a lossless bit rate, no DRM, obviously. And and the amazing thing to us, that's a competitive advantage. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy with the cost of, of storage going down to the point where it's nominal, to sell an Apple lossless format file at a higher price yeah. just seems ludicrous to yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, I literally was doing Google searches today for like highest quality sound files. I mean, I have a Lala account yeah. and I have an Amazon MP3 account. Of course, I'm an iTunes customer. And, and I just didn't, I, I don't know, I, I, did, I, I thought there had to be something more open than even, you know, I, I mean, iTunes kind of knows a lot about what I do. Oh, yeah. And I, don't, and I don't like that so much. Like if Lala offered Flac, right. or even Apple Lossless or whatever, I'd be so happy. Right? Wave or AIFF or just something that was just like real, I'd be, I'd be happy. But. Within a year. Yeah. I mean, you guys are familiar with Moore's Law. What's Moore's Law? What does? Sort of. It's, it's the amount of information that can be stored on a microchip doubles roughly every 18 months. So, you know, 18 months from now, whatever I can hold on my iPhone 3G will be double this amount, you know, and it's, it's exponential. So, I mean, the, the days of MP3s are gone, yeah, yeah. as best I can tell. Yeah, I mean, I had a mastering engineer say to me, um, a really brilliant, like, vinyl, old school mastering engineer, Joe Gasper, sure. say to me that, you know, if the industry's been building to MP3, we've all been doing this for nothing. Yeah. Right. You know, there's got to be a better answer in the offing, and he, you know, he's working with stuff. Everybody's working with something. Yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see what happens. So, I mean, these are the kind of broad topics. I, I really am. I, I want to keep coming back to this as a touch point. Last year, you know, I think that the technical technical buzzwords that we were looking at this time last year was was about real time status update. You know, where are you? Uh, what not, not where are you? What are you doing? What do you, you know, that's what Twitter's about, that's what Facebook's about. I believe that, that this year it's, it's about location-based stuff. Uh, Foursquare, anybody use Foursquare out there? Start, who has iPhones? Okay, download Foursquare, please, that's one of your assignments. They don't even, um, use, they don't even use Twitter. I'm cool with that, I get that. Yeah. I think Twitter is, is largely irrelevant to these guys because they don't have a network to speak yeah. of, so who would they be tweeting out to? Foursquare, on the other hand, I mean, do you disagree? Do you think that no, it's... No, I love Foursquare. I, 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 I've I personally, been using Foursquare lately yeah. and, and liking it. And, um, and I like the geolocation thing that TweetDeck is using now and that, so that you can geolocate tweets. That's really been cool, I think. Yeah, and I think so this location stuff, and it's all part of what I hope that we leave the class with, some sort of plan about how, as Billy says, you can increase your odds on the margin. One of those ways that you're going to increase your odds is by letting the customers... <laughs> that care about you know where you are, right? And, um, you know, we've talked about some, some Foursquare for bands. Foursquare essentially lets you go into a location, go to Felipe's Taqueria, you check in. I'm at Felipe's Taqueria. The GPS affirms this, right? And the more times you go there, the higher your ranking becomes, and eventually you can be the mayor of, Foursquare, of, of Felipe's, which I know we all strive to. I believe I hold that title right now. Um, <laughs> And we have this weird kind of apparent um, quality of competition in games, you know. And they're the first ones who have, have seemed to have combined games with, you know, recommendation and everything else. And it's blowing up. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're going to get acquired probably by Google or something, in, in the, you know. But how this starts to apply to bands. And I really want you all more 
tech savvy or tech aware than I think you currently are. I, I, don't, I don't think it's acceptable, especially if you want jobs. Uh, how many of you are on Mashable? Do you want to look at the Mashable stream ever? The, the, the URL, Mashable. You should. Please bookmark it. Um, it's, it's largely a social media kind of website, but one of the things that they do every week, I think, if not more, is they list job openings, you know? And one after the other is about community management, social media management, all that type of stuff. These are probably your best bets for jobs out of college that, that don't involve, you know, asking if people want cheese on that. Um, so I, I really, I think it would be, we'd be remiss if we didn't start throwing this stuff your way. What you do with it, I don't know, but I, I do know that part of your grade is going to be dependent upon what your technology plan is. It's the one thing, as, you know, as Billy said, the internet was that first leveling thing. Well, it's only gotten more profound. And it is the people that are, are utilizing these tools and putting them together in the best way that are winning. And, and we've got to start identifying them. I think we're lucky enough to have you know, maybe the person who's putting together best stand right here or at the top of the game. I mean, really. Kristen Hirsch and the Strange Angels and all that stuff is consistently pointed to as this is kind of how you should do it. And yet, I, I have to say, you know, uh, that it's, it was, it was uh, necessity that was the mother of that invention, right? It had to be. We, we needed an answer that, was, that, that could sustain us and could, could make the artist free enough to do whatever she wanted to do to go back to, as she says, pure research, mm -hmm. right? She, she sees herself as a scientist, right? It, analogous to a scientist. And, um, you know, when you're a scientist doing research for a corporation, you've got, maybe it's an unspoken pressure, but it's a pressure on you to some extent to deliver something that makes the corporation happy in one way or another. And for the first time in 20 years, this artist is without a, a parent company looking at her. She has only stakeholders to answer to. She has only the people who love her music best to please. And she's created this community of supporters who are earning her more money than she made off of a label in the last 10 years, in any year in the last 10, um, and is able to go to pure research, to go back to doing just the music she hears and wants to make and she's taken a leap of faith that that will in turn make her fans happier than they are than they were with her work before. And they are. They're ecstatic. They're happy to be involved in the process. They're happy to see her creative process. They're saying, you know, are there ways we can help more? We have a, some subscriber, this guy who works for Cambridge Soundworks, mm. who said, yeah, I'm a subscriber, but I have ways I can help more. Does she need any sound equipment? Does she need... Uh, speakers for the studio, you know, what, what, what can she, I want to do more. Take you out of the picture, artist is label, no manager, and I love Kristen, I think she's brilliant. She, she wouldn't like it. She wouldn't like it, and I think she, you know, yeah. Isn't there like a sort of a credibility loss when the artist kind of promotes themselves to be, Absolutely. don't they have to put on a different persona to say, oh, well, I'm in charge of myself, I'm in charge of myself. I think but so, yeah. Work yeah. Assistant. Yeah. I did that at a label when I was a one man label. I had lots of different personalities. It always comes back to bite you, but I do understand the <laughs> impulse. I've wondered also if that isn't isn't for the person who's conducting the the the, 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 the who, who's playing the trick. It is. Like sometimes it's just so you can feel good enough and not self conscious enough. Oh, that's why to I did it. Pitch, yeah, right? absolutely. It, yeah. So sometimes unless you say you have an assistant or something, yeah. they won't even well, I think you have to question, who is it that you're trying to talk to? You know, I, I hear your point, and I, and I think you're right. And I think it goes to this idea as artists' labels not working because your creativity suffers because of the stress of having to pick up the phone and, and book the gig, get the whatever. But I will also say, you know, if, if, it, if you are talking to people that you feel like you've got to devise a persona that isn't just so that you don't, dude, don't, like, text while I'm talking to your neighbor there. Um, um, then it's, it's uh, you know, you have to question what is, who is it you're trying to get their attention of, you know, and to what end. And I think that there's a lot of that. I think there's a lot of unnecessary flail that artists do and young companies do. Like, they, it, goes back, it goes back to this again. It's like, 
oh, what we really need is, is, is distribution. What we really need is a review in the gambit. And I'd like for this class to kind of ask, you know, what, what do you really need? You know, and if you're putting on a persona so that you can get the reviewer at the gambit to review your CD, maybe, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not the best use of your time. If it's not the best use of your time, then we have to suggest what would be a better use of the time. I can think of a lot of things. Over time, I mean, we learned that even though good press is a good thing, press doesn't sell records. Doesn't sell records. You know, even radio play doesn't necessarily sell records. It, it helps an awful lot. What, what sells records, what makes you money, what earns you revenue is the relationship. Right. You, right, you, can, only, you can only really make that ask when you've got a relationship. And it has to be in line with what's appropriate to the relationship. And so, you know, the, the R is constant, right? Whether it's CRM or VRM, the, relationship. the R is the constant, right? It, it, you've got to be, you've got to involve yourself in that relationship. And, you know, the, the clue train said that markets are conversations, and one of the authors just updated that yeah. and changed it to markets are relationships. Right. And it's absolutely true, and, and to, not to press on the CRM, VRM thing, but the analogy that helped me understand it you go, and maybe you guys don't do this so much because you, you're not quite there in your careers yet, but if I go to some sort of party or function or whatever, and I'm talking to someone and we hit it off, what's the, what's the last thing that we do before we part ways? Exchange business cards. And the difference between CRM and VRM would be you and I don't know each other. I walk up to you and I say, give me your business card. You say, fuck you, right? Or you're weird, right? <laughs> and yet, there's so many websites that you go to where before you can do anything, they're asking for your email address. They're asking for whatever. On the other hand, we talk. We find that we have some sort of shared interest. We have a conversation, a relationship of some sort. And it's, it's the easiest thing in the world. Here's my card. And we have to think in those terms as we're devising the technological tools. At what point is it okay to ask for that email? And it's not okay to start there any more than it's okay to go up to some stranger and say, I would really like your business card. And, and I got this a ton running a label. I would go speak at some panel or conference. Could I get your card? No, I don't, you're a freak. I don't want you to have my information, right? That means your freakishness is going to call me or email me or show up at my house, which people did, right? So that's, that's a failure of customer relationship management. If you are a website that's trying to control people to say, I will pull you through this funnel only if you give me this thing, you're strong arming me. <laughs> and the, we, the reason we're able to not do that anymore is why? Why can we start taking over control why can we always take control? What can you always do? We've got alternatives finally, right? We can say, you know what? I don't like the way iTunes is gathering my information. I'm going to go to Lala. It doesn't work anymore because Apple bought Lala. I'm going to go wherever. And if you keep pushing me, where am I going to go? Where do I go? Pirate Bay. And that's exactly, I mean, you guys saw the Netflix Warner Brothers agreement? No? Oh, you guys got to read more. Oh, so what is it? More streaming. So Netflix and Warner came to agreement where Warner now, Netflix now agrees not to rent new releases for 28 days. Why did Warner want them to do this? Um, because people were sharing outside. They feel, Warner feels they've got a higher margin on people walking into a Blockbuster or wherever and buying the DVD, right? What is the logical reaction for the customer to do at this moment? Steal it. You have pushed me too far. You've made it impossible for me to do this in a system that is in any way palatable. It's a failure of the market. Right? And it is the least for, I get why Netflix did it. I, I wish they hadn't because it ain't going to just be Warner. 
all of these studios are going to go, wait a second, Warner gets a 28-day holdback, so do I. Now, I could care less about 500 days of summer or whatever these crappy new releases are. But I think it's, it's only going to push, push people to this. Uh, more titles to stream, more catalog titles, oh. which I'm frankly cool with. That's what I use Netflix for. It's still a failure of the system, right? And, you know, as honest of a person as I am, if I look around for a title and I cannot find it in some agreeable way, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to find that somewhere. I'm going to find that School ED record somewhere. Why no one will make it available, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, so these are the types of things that you have to wrestle with, especially in the business that we're in. And, and you know, the path that you guys have chosen is, is take the damn music. Yeah. Let's make it as easy for you as possible. Well, that's the important thing for us is, has, has been um, taking the leap of faith. The, the idea that we're going to make the music free. But if you want more than the music or if you want to ensure that the music can continue, you'll step up. It's not that different than the NPR model, right? You know, it's not that different than community. Except for you don't have you don't have a government funding. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, it's it's also not that different than than community supported agriculture, right. right? We've talked about this before, and if you were in my class last last semester, sorry, but you know, it's not always worth it to a farmer to speculate, mm -hmm. right? He, you're this farmer, and you grow these heirloom peaches. <laughs> And they cost a lot to grow, and you grow them in this, in this small crop. And if you grow them and you don't sell them, you'll lose a lot of money. But it's easier for you to grow some crap that you know you can sell off at the big market, right? But a group of consumers comes to you and says, hey, 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 we'll pay you to grow those peaches because we love those peaches. And we'll all pay you in um, April mm -hmm. for those peaches that we can have in July. And then that farmer is incentivized to grow those peaches, and he can he can bring those to, to you. You know, you, you you don't have to do without that that those peaches, right? Well, you know, my artist doesn't create junk food. She doesn't create a standard product. She creates a specialized product, and so the people who want to see that thing continue and know that she's got enough money to keep recording and you know stay focused on her art, they're willing to to sponsor those efforts and say. We'll pay you in April to raise those peaches, you know? Just, and, and so she says, well, the, the music can be free. Uh, you know, you can support it. And, and if you support the music, I'll give you some perks, right? Farmer might deliver those peaches to, it's to his supporters, right? Or he might, I don't know, do something, you know, give you some access, some sure. special access, right? Well, Maybe the peaches does. come in a, in a box that you can then use as a planter and maybe right. it's numbered and signed. I mean, right. you know, and in this case, she gives people guest list spots and she lets people have special content. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, access, right? As the, and we talked about this in the entrepreneurship class. I'm not going to drill it down again too much here. But the idea that you're just going to sell a CD, you're leaving so much money on the table. So part of your plans moving forward are, to, and I want you to have this thing, whether you're an artist or you're, you're going to go approach an artist where you can just lay down a bunch of ideas. You guys know this. Most artists are, 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 their ideas, their creative impulses are so buried into kind of creating the music that it's very helpful to have somebody come out with a, with a, a, a clear set of eyes and say, you've got all this stuff. Let's figure out new and interesting ways to put it together. And that's what will get you into kind of the artist management gig, being don't creative. The, don't make the mistake of thinking that it has to be gimmicky. No, no, no. You know, you got all the Josh Freeze stuff, and, you know, everything's gimmick after gimmick. And, yeah. so check out what this guy's doing. It's this wacky thing. He's going to sell you his car. You know, that's like the, uh, the, the, the old Looney Tunes cartoon when, when Daffy Duck is trying to upstage Bugs Bunny, and he gets on stage, and he drinks gasoline and does all this yeah. stuff, and he blows himself up, and the artist goes crazy. And as he's floating up to heaven, he goes, the only problem with that is I can only do that once. Yeah. And that's what Josh Freeze is. I mean, how many times are you going to take mushrooms and drive around and find Marilyn Manson's house, yeah. you know? <laughs> all day long. <laughs> but no, it shouldn't be gimmicky. It has to go back to your values. All right. I, I don't want to go on too long tonight. If you've got more to say, I, I did want to kind of address the, the syllabus. There, so There is a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, and, and what's his name? Cool for guy. Um, yeah, Glenn is. No, no, he didn't stop. Great. This is what I mean. Glenn is now at Billboard, and he has a column. I think it's weekly, if not daily, that it's essentially cool for on Billboard. Okay. And I read the love test letter. I listen to NPR, but I don't 
be careful of old Bob, but yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're reading. Where yeah. do you get all the written reviews? I get that question so much, and I never have a good answer I for know. it. I know. It's, it's hard. You know, you got to sort of do a survey. you got to read a little bit of everything, you know. Hypot and, and, and Fistful of Yin and, you know, and, and I read Seth Godin every day. I do, too. I know. mean, I would say that, that what I would do is I would look for people, look for the authors that you like, find their blog, because I really have them, find their Twitter feed, and follow them. They'll start pushing you to links that they're interested in. Yeah. And then, do you have an RSS reader? Do you got I mean, you've got to get Google, Google, Google Reader is what I use. And that way you can subscribe to certain blogs and they just show up. Everybody, everybody get another part of your assignment. Get Google Reader if you don't have it and find some damn blogs. I and mean, Google's gotten pretty good at this. They will suggest stuff to you also. Yeah. Subscribe to more than you can read and then start parsing them out. Tom um, Peters, Tom Peters. I'm Tom Peters, yeah, I mean, and we can, uh, we can put a list together, but I'm always hesitant to yeah. do that. Snyder asked me that every semester. And it's kind of like, you know, I read a lot of super geeky stuff yeah. that I don't feel like, you know, it works for me, well, but... I, I recommended left sets to my class last semester oh, yeah, with a huge yeah. caveat. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Uh, he's gonna he's gonna be an ass. He's gonna be a freak pretty soon. And, uh, yeah. So just discount that, but read the stuff that's valuable, or get the sense of the legacy business, or whatever. You know, there's some value there. Well, he's but, not he's not wrong. It's it's that line in Lebowski. You're not wrong, man. You're just an asshole. You know. Yeah. <laughs> But no, and, and you know what? Also, we should we should share the stuff when we find stuff that we like. Let's let's try and share it with the class, you know. And and one way we're going to do that is, you know, as you guys come in, you guys have had me before. Bring me in a current event on on some sort of music management, music business related stuff. And you know what? Do it online. Part of the rule is you got to find it from a blog, and that way I'll just list the blogs. All right. So starting next class, find a blog that has some music related stuff. It can't be mine. Um, and and Bring in, bring in a link, and that, that'll be a good way for us to kind of curate some stuff. Um, order the books on Amazon. Uh, get started on Good to Great. Okay, start with that. Um, the rest of the stuff you can read at your, at your leisure. But um, what, what I've always done in the past, and, and, and Billy and I are, are certainly going to work on this collaboratively, but I've tried to take the first half of the class to go through the book reading, look at Good to Great, teach management, quote unquote management, you know, as if you were, as if I was teaching a, a management class to, to uh, you know, in the business school. And then the second half of the class, try and apply that stuff to artist management. So, you know, we might talk about, in good to great, you know, first who, then what, which talks about kind of human resource management, but then we'll talk about an artist contract and kind of go, a management right. contract, yeah. go through that. Um, and, and that's how we'll do it. And the 12 weeks will fly by because it's, there's a lot of information here. But I keep stressing this, I want to end with you guys delivering a management plan for yourself or for some artist. I think that will be beneficial. Anything else from you? No, I, I, I mean, I, I love that. I, I really would urge you guys to, to um, participate and to discuss and to, and, to, and to dissent. If you have anything that doesn't make sense to you or you disagree with, say it, please. Couldn't because, agree more. Because we're going to try to make as much of this class a conversation as possible. It's, it's going to be a way better class if you guys converse with us. I still don't know what RSS means. Really. Real simple syndication. Just like, just search, Google what is RSS. There are great explainers and, and, and primers to, uh, to RSS. It just means stuff gets pushed to you when you, you know, on, it, when you want it in a reader. You know, it gets pushed to you every time there's something new, right? Somebody can subscribe to Kristen's tour dates via RSS, and then every time I upload a new tour date, it gets pushed to them. So they can't miss it. They can't ignore it. Okay? Like new blog entries will be like an email. Uh, yeah, or, or it'll show up in a reader. In a reader. And yeah. that's Google Reader uses RSS to pull all the stuff that you're interested in. Okay? Google right. Reader is the easiest way to use it. Thanks, guys. Please be sure to have the books by next time. Start reading good to great. Just start from chapter one. We'll plow through it. <laughs>